So welcome everyone to this launch of Memories of a Gay Catholic Boyhood with John D'Amelio. We are very honored to have him here with us. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder with my partner, the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is the space you find yourself in right now. Uh, the Bureau, we like to say, is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And we hold this space for queer books and queer culture. Uh, so we have regular bookstore hours, Wednesdays through Sunday, 1 to 7 p.m. And then we stay open late when we have events like this. And we seem to be on a, a religion kick these days. Not only do we have an exhibition called Satanic Panel, and yes, Satanism is a legitimate religion, uh, but we've also had a few religious events. Uh, on Sunday, we did one with Emptying the Pews, uh, Stories of Leaving the Church. And uh, tomorrow we have, um, my mind just went blank. Uh, Gerard is going to be doing a, a novel about uh, uh, his Catholic youth. So here we are, it's in the air. <laughs> so the Bureau is an all volunteer organization. We have Hal Lance who's helping us out tonight. Um, we do have a suggested donation of 10 bucks uh, that give what you can. And if you would rather buy a book, that's a great way to use your money instead. But I'll pass this around and there's change in here if you need it. And uh, we appreciate your support. I also wanted to say, if you're not already on our email list and you'd like to sign up for that, you can do that at the register and you'll get an email every other Monday about our many upcoming events. Um, so I'm gonna introduce John and then we're gonna get started. So, a pioneer in the field of LGBTQ studies and the history of sexuality, John D'Amelio has written or edited almost a dozen books, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority, Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America, and Lost Prophet, The Life and Times of Bayard Rust. Please welcome John D'Amelio. Thank you, Greg, for having me. Thank you, folks, for coming. Uh, it's especially nice to be talking about my book in the city where the book is set. Everything that happens in the book happened in New York City because I'm a native. Uh, so what I want to do tonight, uh, I want to start off by saying a little bit about the motivation and the process that went into writing the memoir. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, the structure, the content, themes, the sort of questions it's asking. And then I'll finish up by reading two or maybe depending on the time, three passages from different parts of the book. Uh, so uh, what led me to write this? I, I, didn't, um, I didn't begin with the intention of writing a memoir, even though I had already written many books. But in 2004, I had open heart surgery. And literally lying in the hospital uh, the night before the surgery, I was wondering whether I could still be here the next day. Uh, I found myself flooded by memories. Uh, and they were, you know, cherished memories of childhood, of grandma's house, of the neighborhood and the parish and friends I had and things like that. Uh, and, you know, back home, recovered from the surgery, back to regular life. What I found myself doing in my free time was writing some of these stories up just randomly. Uh, and doing it for my own satisfaction. Uh, never thought I would be showing them to anybody else. Uh, meanwhile, though, at the same time, I've been teaching undergraduate courses in uh, US history, especially since World War II in the 1960s and in LGBTQ history. And one of the things that was unmistakably true about teaching undergraduates these courses over a number of years is that the kind of reading they enjoy more than anything else was memoir. Not memoir of presidents or generals or corporate executives, but memoirs of ordinary people whose lives somehow intersected with the themes and events of a particular era. And at a certain point, it occurred to me, oh my heavens, I have enough of these separate stories that I bet you I could pull them together and write a memoir in which what I'm asking basically is how uh, 
the conformist, family-oriented baby boom years of the 1950s become the tumultuous years of political protest and upheaval in the 1960s. And so, you know, that kind of led me uh, to do it. So uh, what, is, what are the kind of questions the book is asking? What are the themes it explores? Uh, here's a, just a few of them. One is, uh, <laughs> how does a boy raised in a family where the adults were strong supporters of Joseph McCarthy and Richard Nixon, and where they were sure that President Roosevelt's New Deal was leading us down the road to communism, how does this kid become an anti-war activist and pacifist? Okay. Um, how does a boy uh, from a family in which almost no one ever read a book? My mother occasionally opened the Bible and you know, caressed the pages <laughs> of the Bible. Uh, how does he come to go down a path that ultimately leads to him producing intellectual work that is actually cited in an important Supreme Court decision. Uh, how does a boy from an Italian immigrant family in which no one, I mean, no one ever missed Sunday mass and whose parents uh, ended each evening by saying the rosary together before they went to bed, how does he become a lapsed Catholic? Uh, and then finally, uh, how does a boy from a multi-generational family in which not even the word divorce is spoken, uh, how does he come to explore the hidden sexual underworld of gay New York in the years before Stonewall? Uh, so with that, those kinds of things in mind, the book is divided into three parts. Um, the first part is very focused on family, neighborhood, uh, church, school, friends. Uh, it tells the story of this multi-generational Italian family who spent every possible moment together. Uh, on any Sunday, there were at least, at least 15 of us gathered together at what we described as Big Grandma's house. Uh, on many Sundays, there were even more than that. Uh, during the summer, I was there every day of the week playing with my cousins who were also there. Uh, it also, besides talking about the family and the togetherness of it, uh, describes the Bronx and my particular neighborhood, Parkchester, uh, where I grew up in the 50s, uh, and, and the sense of privilege that my parents felt of being able to live there. Uh, both of them had grown up in the South Bronx uh, in tenement districts uh, filled with working class immigrant families that were struggling to survive and just manage to get by. Uh, and the idea that my parents could get an apartment in a new housing project that actually had elevators uh, and lawns and playgrounds for kids to play in was just seemed miraculous uh, to them. Uh, this part of the book also talks very much about Catholicism, uh, uh, the parish, uh, the school that I went to, that all my cousins went to, that all the kids that I knew, I only knew kids who went to Catholic school. I grew up convinced that the world was composed of Catholics, Jews, and one Protestant family. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, I talk about the friendships that formed in the school. Uh, the same group of 35 boys were together in class every day for five years. Uh, we played together. Uh, we also uh, survived together the discipline of our teachers, uh, like Sister Perpetua, for instance, who in the first grade uh, threatened to lock me in the basement overnight with the rats who would eat me. Uh, <laughs> Brother William, who was the school principal and a big hefty guy who walked around with this thick leather strap attached to his clerical robes that he freely used on any boy who misbehaved. Uh, when my mother, you know, I, I came to believe that I really had to go to confession every Saturday or I was gonna burn in hell for all eternity. Uh, when my mother told me one night over dinner uh, when I had cracked my knuckles, don't crack your knuckles, John. 
I was sure that every time after that that I cracked my knuckles, it was a sin that I had to confess or else hell. Uh, second part of the book is about uh, Regis, uh, which was a Jesuit high school uh, for academically gifted boys uh, in Manhattan. Uh, admission depended on a very competitive entrance exam. And suddenly this kid who had almost never left the neighborhood, uh, you know, once a year we would go to the Museum of Natural History so I could see the dinosaurs. Uh, but now he's taking the subway to the Upper East Side every day, uh, watching doormen open the doors of limousines so that residents could get out and go into their building. Uh, did things like this really exist, I wonder? Um, wonderful friendships formed in this school as well. Uh, on Fridays, when we didn't have three hours of homework due the next day, uh, we would wander down to Midtown and the theater district and uh, go to these great movie palaces that were still on Broadway and see things like The Sound of Music. Um, it also uh, describes the intellectual challenges of this very good Catholic boy in this Catholic school is now learning Greek and Latin and is reading all about gods and goddesses who plot and strict scheme and kill each other in order to be the most powerful god or goddess in the world. Uh, I also uh, was recruited into the speech and debate society in this high school. Uh, which was a nationally competitive school. And pretty soon, not only am I going to Manhattan, but I'm traveling all around the country to uh, debate and speech tournaments. And over the course of four years, bringing home dozens of trophies uh, to fill our living room and our bedroom and make my mother proud of, of her son. Uh, it also, while it was wonderful, it also created as you can imagine, a great deal of stress. Would I be good enough this weekend? You know, and uh, so every Thursday morning when there was a tournament, I would wake up and my face like, exploded with acne. I was so, you know, anxious. Um, the final part of the book is about my years at Columbia, uh, where I went to college and was able to live on campus. Uh, <laughs> during freshman orientation week, uh, I was put in a discussion group led by the Protestant campus minister who <laughs> informed us all that God was dead. Uh, at the end of freshman orientation week, uh, the whole class is pulled together into the, an auditorium to hear a lecture by an iconic professor at Columbia who I later studied with. Uh, and it's a 45 minute lecture that culminates in his informing us that the war in Vietnam is wrong and unjust. Uh, and, you know, it's like, I mean, pretty soon I'm meeting classmates who tell me they don't believe in hell and don't even believe in God. And I'm thinking, wow, they must be able to do anything they want. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I mean, clearly, so, you know, my philosophical and political views and views about everything are being completely challenged. And those were years of tremendous protest and uh, tumultuousness on the Columbia campus, 1966 to 1970. Uh, and pretty soon I find myself, you know, there are black power radicals, there are anti-war activists, uh, there are radical activists who want to overthrow the system, which is the way, the phrase they use. And pretty soon I'm going on all these demonstrations and marching in the streets and running from the police who are chasing after us because we're blocking traffic in, uh, on the streets. And all of this is happening while this once good Catholic boy is also trying to figure out how to come to terms with the undeniably strong sexual desires that I feel for other men. Uh, this uh, first started asserting itself. I noticed this when I was in high school at Regis traveling on the subway every day, looking at men and feeling sexual arousal that I couldn't explain to myself, I had no words for, but I knew if I was getting an erection while I was riding on the train, it was something I had to confess. Uh, in you know, I was starting to have sex with men I met. Uh, in college, I had a little bit more freedom because I wasn't living at home anymore, so I didn't have to explain to my mother and father what I had been doing before I got home. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, remember, well, you know, some of you will remember this, but 
I mean, this is a period of time uh, when there, you know, there isn't a lesbian mayor of Chicago or a gay member of the cabinet or celebrities and entertainers who are completely out of the closet uh, and books that can fill a whole bookstore. Uh, it was a time when there was, you know, almost nothing available to inform you of what these feelings were about. Uh, so um, that gives you sort of an overall impression, a sense of the book. Uh, I want to read, uh, I'm going to read two separate passages. And uh, I thought these would be particularly appropriate for a bookstore to be reading them uh, because they're each about a book uh, that in each in a different way uh, profoundly influenced uh, my, uh, my life and my understanding of myself. Um, so first one. Um, it was in high school that a sexual yearning, a, year, a longing for men's bodies began to take hold of me. Maybe it was the freedom to feel forbidden things now that I was leaving the neighborhood each day. Perhaps these feelings were so taboo that I could never let them surface when I was in home territory. Or was it just the fact of entering those post-puberty years when sexual urges themselves asserted themselves so strongly? Whatever the explanation, the feelings were there. They were powerful and undeniable. Interestingly, they were not directed in my peers at school. New York's subway system was the place where these longings unfolded. After dad and I stopped taking the train together and I was riding to school alone, I looked for a place next to a man who struck me as attractive. I suddenly tried to have my legs pressed against his. Yeah. I took advantage of the lurching of the subway as it pulled out of the station and held my leg firmly in place as his shifted unintentionally against mine. I kept my legs steady ever so slightly invading his space. It was such a meager physical connection that I doubt these strangers noticed it. But for me, it was unbelievably exciting. Why was I doing this? How did I explain it to myself? I had no idea, no explanation, no words to give it meaning. Except, of course, my Catholic training. If I was getting an erection, it must be sinful. And since this happened almost daily, the pull to confession became more and more compelling. I tried to make a firm resolve as my act of contrition specified, but inevitably a morning arrived when a guy that I found appealing had an empty seat next to him and the cycle began again. This continued for a year. Then in sophomore year, something happened that changed my perspective forever. Mr. Ridley was my teacher in a course on American literature. As we approached the works of the mid 20th century, he asked us to write a report on a contemporary novel of our choosing. I had no experience with current fiction. And so after class, I stayed behind to ask his advice. He looked at me, his index finger and thumb touching his lip as he reflected. And then he said, Try James Baldwin's Another Country. It was a bestseller and it just came out in paperback. I describe it as a novel for mature audiences. Another Country was unlike any novel I had ever read. It lacked the propriety so central to the 19th century novels I had consumed. Sex was everywhere and Baldwin mixed it with emotions that splattered across every page. His characters were riding roller coasters of feeling that drove them into relationships and then tore those relationships apart. Did Mr. Ridley see something in me that I hadn't yet identified? It couldn't have been an accident that of all the novels he might have suggested, he chose one in which homosexual relations play a major role. On the very first page, Rufus is in a Times Square movie theater. A man sits next to him as soon as reaching over to grip rope him. To me, it was a shock. Were there such men? Did they do things like this? 
should I be going to movies alone instead of with my <laughs> Regis friends? <laughs> As the novel progressed, a geography of male encounters emerged. Times Square and 42nd Street, Washington Square Park, bars near the Hudson River in Greenwich Village. But it was a geography of danger as much as anything. Feelings for men left characters tormented. The conflict, the torment, the inability to stop oneself from stumbling down the trail of one's emotions, all were seared into my brain. So, I mean, it was this important moment. I mean, I literally had a word to describe what it was I was feeling and understand that there are other human beings like me, but it didn't make me feel good about myself. Um, so uh, the next paragraph uh, uh, passage I'll read uh, is also about a book, uh, but we're now jumping ahead three years. It's the end of my freshman year in, at Columbia. I've stopped going to church. Uh, I've said to myself, this is who I am. It didn't feel like a good thing, but it just was the fact that I knew I wasn't going to be able to change. And it was still something that I would have never dreamed of talking to anyone about. And then that summer between freshman and sophomore year. One evening, walking on Third Avenue, my eyes locked with someone. His name was Luis. He was a Cuban who had fled the revolution and now worked at the United Nations. He lived nearby and took me to his apartment where we had sex. But instead of my leaving immediately afterward, which had always been the case with the few experiences that I had, Luis invited me to stay for dinner. Maybe because I had now turned a corner and was seeing myself as homosexual, I began talking to him about my life. Luis made me comfortable enough that I felt the freedom to share the struggles I was having. He listened patiently, talked about the hard times he had gone through earlier in life, and assured me that things would change. I so wanted to believe him. As I was about to leave, he signaled to me to wait. He walked to a bookcase and pulled out a thin volume. Read this, he said, as he placed it in my hands. A friend gave it to me a few years ago. It offered a comfort that I badly needed as I was struggling with my love for a man. Maybe it will help you too. The book was De Profundis by Oscar Wilde. I thanked Luis, we kissed goodbye, and I took the subway home. That night, I couldn't sleep. The conversation with Luis had left me awash in feelings. Finally, I got up and tiptoed quietly to the living room. I opened the book, began reading, and finished it in a single sitting. 50 years later, I still place it among the most profound pieces of writing I have ever encountered. Nothing else that I have read changed my life to the extent that it did. Oscar Wilde's words allowed me to see my sexual desires in an entirely new light and to imagine a life with integrity. Written while he was still in prison, De Profundis detailed the story of Wilde's love for Lord Alfred Douglas and how it led ultimately to his trial and imprisonment. Yet even though his passion for Douglas brought ruin, De Profundis is very much a paean to love and surprisingly one that Wilde grounded in the story of Jesus. To Jesus, according to Wilde, love was the first secret of the world. The lessons Wilde drew from the moral vision of Jesus spoke to me directly. The real fool, he wrote, is he who does not know himself. His peroration, repeated many times in the course of the text, whatever is realized is right, was like a clarion call. I read it as a command to recognize the rightness of my deepest feelings. Reading those pages, I considered for the first time that loving men might be morally good. It is barely an exaggeration to say that De Profundis saved my life. And, uh, you know, to make the point uh, really clear, a couple of weeks after reading it, uh, I wrote a letter to two of my best friends in high school and came out to them. 
uh, I was clearly at a point where I still couldn't imagine saying it face to face to someone, but at least in a letter, I could do it. And they wrote back and they were completely accepting. And in the fall, when I went back to Columbia, I told my three or four best friends that I was gay and you know, still in the closet, so to speak, but life was beginning to change. So I could probably read many more passages, but I think I will stop there. Uh, and I'd be happy to get comments, questions, responses, anything. What kind of sources did you have to work with for you know what happened and how you felt so long ago? But you mean for writing the memoir? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, so the memoir, just to make clear the boundaries of it, the memoir stops in 1971, a year after I graduated from college, at the point at which I decide I'm going to graduate school to study US history. This is what I want to do with my life. So it's those first 23 years. And for a good part of it, uh, you know, the family, every time we, the family got together, which was all the time in my childhood and adolescence, Part of what it did was tell stories that happened in the family, even though they only happened two weeks ago. So, I mean, you know, it's just like we were constantly reliving the experiences we had. Plus my mother kept the most amazing photograph albums, you know, of like anything that any, that any family member ever did. And my dad uh, worked for a camera store. And so he had access to, you know, one of those handheld movie cameras took lots of family movies that have had at some, a certain point all got converted into, uh, you know, not a DVD, uh, uh, a video cassette. So I had all of that to look at to sort of remind me of these things that were in my head. Um, the, the only actual research that I did was in writing about the Columbia years, just to make sure I wasn't making things up. Uh, I did uh, read the Columbia Spectator online uh, for the four years that I was there to, you know, have my memory coincide with, you know, what might have actually happened. So I, I kind of, and oh, and I'm still really good friends with a lot of the guys I went to high school with. And so we tell stories and share experiences as well. One of those high school friends, uh, one of the ones that I wrote to to say that I was gay, uh, in, you know, before, you know, Twitter and texting and stuff like that, in college, in the course of the semester, I wrote a book length amount of letters to my friends. And Vinny, when he knew I was writing a memoir, he had saved all my letters and sent them to me. So I had like, you know, three years of my letter writing about <clears throat> all the things that were happening. So, yeah. Uh, Kirk, after you were getting more awareness of the world, sexuality and stuff. You were still going home on weekends and you had to go to mass with your family. Or how did you let them know you weren't going to mass? And how did that mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I would go home to visit the family, but I wouldn't go home for a weekend. You know, I would take the subway home to the Bronx on a Sunday, but I would get there after they had come back from mass and we would all be together for Sunday dinner and the family gathering. So uh, it was a while before my mother knew that I wasn't going to church. But since I wasn't living, and there were a couple of times that there was, I, actually there was one time when she figured it out and was yelling and screaming at me about it. Uh, and she said, we're gonna stop paying your tuition. You're gonna go to Fordham. Uh, <laughs> and, but she didn't, you know, given that they barely graduated from high school, she didn't know how you could get somebody to leave one college and go to another one. So she never carried out the threats. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Did you ever come out to your family? I did, as a matter of fact. And it's, uh, if I write a volume two, it'll be in that one. It happens, it happens about three years after this one ends. And it happens at the point when I'm in graduate school where I decide I'm going to do a dissertation on gay history. And I realized, okay, 
how am I not going to talk to my parents for five years about the <laughs> dissertation that I'm writing? And so over a period of a few visits, I started dropping clues. Uh, in the, like first I said I was going to write something about sex. Then I said, well, I think I've narrowed it to three topics. I'll either write about prostitution, uh, venereal disease, or homosexuality. <laughs> and finally, I come home one night for the next chapter, whatever that might be. Uh, and this time, as we're eating dinner, before I can say anything, uh, my dad puts down the knife and fork and looks at me and says, John, your mother and I have been talking. <laughs> And we're going to ask you a question and we want you to tell us the truth. And I don't know how they came up with this phrase. Are you a gay person? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I came out. And it led to like a whole night of conversation and three or four more visits in which they would ask lots of questions. And then, you know, it was going up. I mean, you know, they weren't happy, but it seemed to be going all right. And then I come home one night for the next conversation. And before it starts, we're at the table and my dad puts down the knife and fork again and says, John, your mother and I have been talking and we don't know if this will upset you, but we really feel we need to tell the whole family. <laughs> so, and I thought this is the most wonderful thing in the world. My parents are gonna come out to the entire family for me, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, everybody. And, they did, and, and they did, you know, and the way I describe it, or I think about it, is that in the end, it demonstrated that my parents ultimately were more Italian than Catholic. <laughs> that family was everything. And the fact that I was their son, you know, whatever the church might say, I'm their son. So it was amazing, it was just like amazing. I don't know that I could have pulled it off while I was in college because I still had my own set of ambivalent feelings about this, but you know, by the time I was involved in gay liberation, deciding to do a dissertation, I was just in a totally different position. So, yeah. Did you not have subsequent cousins and uncles that were gay? Um, this is a very good question. Uh, no, I, I don't. I you know, I know it seems unlikely, but if I think about all of my first cousins on both sides of the family. One of them never got married and lived with his parents their entire lives to, and took care of them. But if he was, who knows, if, you know, if he's anything, <laughs> you know, um, but no, nobody else, you know, it's just me. <laughs> Any other, yeah. John, I'm wondering if you ever engaged um, later in life, if you ever re-engaged school you went to or church you went to. Well, I, I never I never went back to the Catholic Church. I mean, I don't have any relationship with the Catholic Church, but uh, I stayed connected to my high school. Uh, and I mean, one on this trip, one of the you know to talk about the world that we live in has changed, or that I live in has changed from these days. Uh, this Jesuit high school, on one day in the morning, I spoke to a creative writing class of seniors about my memoir and about the process of writing and read a passage or two. Uh, after school, I spoke to a group of students who were members of what is just called PRISM, which is the Gays and Allies support group in the school. And in the evening, I spoke to a group that's called Open Regis, which is the network of gay alumni that the school supports. Like who would have imagined in the 1960s that there would ever be a Catholic environment where this might go on? So, you know, it's just completely accepting and congratulatory and yeah, it's really something. And, and in addition to that, uh, another thing I've done on this trip is that I spoke to, uh, uh, it's, I don't remember what the actual name of it is, but it's a group, it's the gay men's group at Xavier Parish, uh, you know, not uh, Xavier Church, not far from here, actually. So there are, there's change and lots of surprising places.
Yeah. <clears throat> How did your experience as a historian influence your writing? You talk about your writing. Did it feel like, because uh, there are a couple of historians uh, in France who write their uh, memoirs as well, uh, mm -hmm. and then you wrote that. And, and so I, she talked about that. So I was wondering if you thought about that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, you know, if you read memoirs, uh, and I do, but I mean, there's a whole range of them. And some of them, are, some memoirs are stories that are written by someone that is just, it's totally, it's almost like an interior story. It's really about the self and the emotional composition and the personal struggles and the like, and almost completely detached from the world around that person. Uh, but because as a historian, I mean, I'm, I was very much conscious of the world around me in which this was happening. And especially in the la latter part of the book where uh, I'm talking about my years at Columbia, it's just grounded in sort of the history of the period, even though, you know, like I'm the narrative center of the book. I mean, you know, for instance, one of the things that I didn't read about uh, is, you know, I make the decision uh, in college, I'm against the war that I'm going to be a conscientious objector. And because I don't believe in violence or war. And when I bring this up to my parents to ask them is, when I was a sophomore, would they write a letter for me? My dad, who was not the screamer in the family, uh, that was my mother. Um, my, before I could practically get the next sentence out, he gets up and starts screaming, you know, you're not my son anymore, uh, pack your things, I don't want to see you again. I pushed it away, I said, I can't do this now, all right. But as a senior, I went back to them and said, you know, I am doing this now because I will lose my draft deferment at the end of the year. And what that led to, and there's a passage, a long passage that discusses this, it led to a complete retelling of the family, of a family saga. Uh, my parents, my dad, agreed. he asked me some questions, you know, about whether I really wouldn't fight in a war. And we got into an argument and finally he said, I'll write a letter for you. And what I then learned is that he then retold the story of his experience in World War II, where the family story had always been that he got a medical discharge because he injured his back. And that night when he agreed to write a letter in support of my application, I learned that he got a medical discharge because he refused to do anything in the military. He just stayed in his bed and tr actually tried to commit suicide. And the psychiatrist gave him a medical discharge. Um, and he, he only my mother knew that story. Everybody else for a generation had believed that he was discharged from the army because of physical incapacity. So it was, yeah, very profound. Is that in the book? Yes. Wow. And my father had already passed away. So I felt like I could write about it because I never told that, I, I never told that story to anyone either. So it was at that point it became well, my mother, my mother, my father, me, and I told my brother about it. Was he in Europe or the Pacific? Or? Uh, well, he wasn't sent overseas. He was still at home. And but when they were given the order to go overseas, he refused to get out of bed. Hey. Yeah. That's so, one way. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. as an altar boy, did you encounter? Uh, priests uh, sexually abusing altar boys? No, never. I mean, I never, you know, it's like, I know this is like, seems to be endemic in the Catholic Church now, but I never heard of any such thing. Uh, I never knew about a priest who later on who got into trouble. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It was, I mean, I, I, you know, it's this is maybe a funny way of putting it, but uh, I grew up in a completely asexual world. I mean, you know, I had 12 years of Catholic education. We had no sex education. No sex education. I don't, you know, I mean, in the fifth grade, a group of us were playing together and one of the kids started talking and said, 
I'd heard from my brother how babies are made. <laughs> and so we all thought, oh, how are babies made? And he, 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 he said, this 10 year old said to the rest of us, well, women have a hole where we have our cock and you put your finger up there and a baby comes out. <laughs> <laughs> that was our sex education. <laughs> So, yeah, so no, I mean, I, I didn't, I don't know of anything. I'm not saying it wasn't happening, but no one knew about it. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering about like your path to politics and politicization. Like, did you find that a lot of other young gay people had a similar kind of pathway, were similarly attracted when you left? Was that about just kind of the times? Was that about that particular experience trajectory yeah in my particular experience it's simply about the times like it turns out like I, I came out to about four of my friends in college and then met two or three other guys in the dorms who were gay uh, but one of my very close friends who I came out to then simultaneously came out to me and I mean he described himself as bisexual even in those days he was able to use that word uh, but uh, and but he too became an anti-war activist. You know, at Columbia, it's like you had two. I mean, you had two options. You could be involved in the protests, or you could be one of these horribly reactionary guys who were almost all, you know, athletic jocks <laughs> and members of the fraternities. You know, but everybody else just seemed to be, you know marching on campus and in the streets. It was so much a part of the time. And I didn't make any kind of association between it and my being gay. And, you know, I read about the Stonewall riots. I knew that they had happened. And I thought, oh, that's kind of amazing. But at least at that point, it seemed I had no idea how I would ever get involved in something like that because I wasn't that far out yet. So yeah, and way back there. Yeah, uh, since you talked about the profound impact of books on your life, uh, when talking to uh, young queer people at the high school or early college age, are there any books written in the last ten or twenty years that you would recommend? Oh God! Young people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. There are too many to even think about, uh, and and my mind isn't. I'm trying to think about some of the courses that I taught where I would uh, use often novels that were written, you know, young adult novels that were written. And I'm, I'm just totally blocking on, uh, on, Luna? on it. Luna? No. No, no. But uh, although I will say that one of the books that I've I, I used a lot in history, in history courses as opposed to like, you know, a gay studies course where we are just reading about the contemporary world. Uh, but, you know, writing about the 1970s, I would often uh, assign Ruby from Jungle uh, by Rita Mae Brown. And even though it's a very dated novel at this point, it, it really speaks powerfully to that moment in time. Uh, and it's a, a pretty compelling narrative. So students, even 30, 40 years later, would get into it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just thinking about you, sorry, law, no say gay, but heard a story this morning uh, about the student newspaper last year or whatever. They were said that they closed the news paper down, the student Any advice or comments for the Mr. Ripley's of <laughs> students well, in these areas, whether Republicans are so harassed? To, uh, to say, to use historical analogy, the kind of first round of this kind of stuff that's going on now happened like in 1977 with Anita Bryant in Florida and the repeal of a gay rights ordinance, a sexual orientation non-discrimination ordinance uh, in South Florida. And, and after that happened, and Brian then started traveling around the country and a couple of other cities, 
also repeal their ordinances and things like that. Um, it provoked more demonstrations and larger demonstrations than the community had seen yet. And as one example in Chicago, when Anita Bryant came to speak sometime in 1977, it did pr produce in reaction the largest LGBTQ demonstration that had happened yet in Chicago. And one of the participants was interviewed uh, by um, the local newspaper about it. And she wasn't identified by name, so I have no idea who it is, it's so unfair. Uh, but her phrase, what, the phrase that she used to the reporter is, every kick is a boost. And this has happened kind of repeatedly that, uh, that the sort of right-wing reaction to uh, LGBTQ organizing, yeah, it's very dangerous and it does bad things, but it also tends to have the effect of mobilizing. And we're still at the beginning of this new phase of the don't say gay and the book banning and stuff like that. But my expectation is that it, in ways that we maybe can't predict, uh, since I'm not immediately in those activist networks now, it will create more forms of protest and resistance. So every kick, every boost. kick is a boost. So, you know, Anita, Anita Bryan kicked us, but hey, it just pushed us forward. <laughs> yeah. Anything else or, yeah. Are you thinking of a second volume? I am thinking of a second volume. I'm trying to do it with no pressure on myself, you know, to be relaxed and go ahead. Um, and uh, if I do, if it materializes, the second volume would cover the 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, and it would be a different kind of book in the sense in relation to a question that came earlier, because in this case, I'm really involved in historical events and a participant. So it's, you know, it's my story, but I'd be writing about people who were also there and can comment and, you know, I have a lot of files that tell me all about this. So I, you know, it'll be more complex to write volume two. Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Since Catholic is in the title of your book, why did you give up the church? Uh, partly, um, well, gay, it, it actually isn't entirely about being gay. Gay is in the background of it, but it was the experience of going to Columbia and you know, the Protestant campus minister tells you that God is dead. And then meanwhile, you take a Western Civ course in which you read class of philosophers who, dis, who prove, disprove the existence of God and you realize I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, yeah, you win that debate. I can't, I can't persuade you. And I just found myself intellectually thinking this doesn't make sense. And then the conflict with being gay became more and more sharp. And I realized there's no way I'm going to be able to say I'm gay and remain a Catholic. So left it behind and life went on. Yeah. But before you were left it behind, had you ever told a priest in a confessional that you were gay? I told the priest regularly in the confessional. First, as things developed, I had impure actions with myself X number of times. And then I had impure actions with other men X number of times. But, you know, I, and it's gonna sound funny, and if you read my story of the last confession, you'll get it. Uh, in the darkness of the confessional whispering as we did, for all I know, the priest often thought I might have been a girl saying I had impure actions <laughs> with a man. So, yeah, so I, I never named it, I, you know, in any way until Finally, there was the last confession, and I realized this is, I'm never doing this again. And Lisa, you had to do some sort of penance, you said? Yeah, you had to do penance, but you know, I, I swear, I, really, I swear to God, in all, <laughs> in all the years that I went to confession, I mean, almost every time the penance was, no matter what you said, was say one hour father and two Hail Marys, you know, or, you know, maybe, you know, they might say, say a rosary, but. Would you be offended if I quoted uh, 
old Jesuit friend that we were on an excursion in uh, actually Yellowstone. I think he was no longer in the order, as he said. It was a gay group traveling, as he said. I never knew a Jesuit who wasn't a gay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Uh, Perhaps he had a limited circle. <laughs> so uh, coincidentally, yes. The two high school friends that I wrote to after reading the Oscar Wilde were both in seminary and they're both still Jesuits yeah. and they're both. Okay. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> but that was my question, but maybe take a different turn. But when you think about Mr. Ripley on and so on, and it feels like maybe your experience that you read just as someone that's different from the Catholic American Catholic more generally was this thing about the Jesuits. I wasn't thinking about orientation, but about philosophy and social attitudes that might enable them to be more supportive of some of these changes. Are the Jesuits different? Well, I mean, my experience with the Jesuits, and this has remained true through the personal connections that I have, is that at least to the degree that I had involvement with them, they were very social justice oriented. I mean, in high school, we were doing community, they, they created these opportunities for doing community service work. Uh, one of the Jesuit priests uh, in my school went on actually to become a lawyer who did a lot of cases, I mean, took on cases about housing for poor people. And so, yeah, I mean, it very much was uh, a social justice emphasis. And so in that respect, the fact that my high school today is doing what it's doing is kind of consistent with what I might have expected, except it was unimaginable 60 years ago. Well, what do you think? Should we? Yeah? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. There are books back there that if you'd like to buy one, you'd like to sell one, and I'm happy <laughs> to sign any book that you buy. Perfect. Thank you so much.